Okay, good day, Leonard Silks and colleagues. On behalf of Tobina Erojikwe, Chairman of Nigerian Bar Association Institute of Continuing Legal Education, I welcome you all to day six of this seven day course on debt recovery and asset tracing. So today's session will focus on asset tracing and cross-border asset recovery. And to do justice to this topic, our very experienced practitioners, um, we have Edward Cumming, King's Council, and then Tom Stewart Coates. Um, before we proceed, I'll take their citation, and then I'll do some bit of housekeeping before I yield the floor to them. So Edward Cumming, King's Council, He's been described as the perfect modern barrister and, in quotes, just one of the best around. Edward has acted for some of the most significant and high profile commercial private wealth and asset recovery litigation of recent years, both in England, where he is based, and internationally, including in leading offshore jurisdictions such as Jersey, Guernsey, the Cayman Islands the BVI, Bermuda, the Bahamas, and Hong Kong. He frequently acts in disputes for Nigerian clients or which, or which have a Nigerian angle. With particular experience in relation to issues of contractual interpretation, having appeared in the leading Supreme Court Authority of Wood and Capital Insurance Services Limited 2017, two cases 1173, he is recognized as, in quote, expertly combining a chancery and commercial law practice. And reflecting this, he is recommended as the leading King's Council in nine separate categories in the latest Chambers and Partners, and eight separate categories in the latest Legal 500. The directories, which have long recognized Edward as a, in quotes, lion in court, described him as just an amazing individual and a very smooth advocate who is persuasive, articulate, and nimble on his feet. He can, in quotes, claim and persuade, but will fight tenaciously when the need arises. He is utterly fearless, as well as being, in quotes, wonderfully talented, very nice, and someone with a brain the size of a planet. His energy and ability to grab a case in nanoseconds are astonishing. Quote closed. So I read Tom Stewart Coates citation. So Tom is described in legal directories as uh, in quote highly intelligent and effective advocate with a glittering future ahead. He's also described as in quote a truly excellent barrister who can manage large cases very well. Tom acts in civil fraud and asset recovery cases in, involving assets and defendants based in multiple jurisdictions and has experience seeking and obtaining urgent injunctive relief, including freezing orders, asset disclosure orders, and passport orders in both the English courts and offshore. Tom acted in the leading English case, which addressed the interaction between confiscation orders designed to secure and seize the alleged assets of crime and proprietary claims by private parties. Tom has also acted for and against defendants facing contempt proceedings to breach of previous court orders made in civil fraud and asset recovery proceedings. Tom frequently acts for clients from Africa including states, state-owned enterprises or entities and private companies and individuals, and has a particular sectoral focus on banking and financial services disputes and disputes arising out of projects in the construction, infrastructure, energy, and natural resources sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Edward and Tom, but before I yield the floor to them, please permit me to do just one, make one, just, just one housekeeping um, announcement. I reckon that there will be so many questions coming in, but in order not to disrupt the presentation, I appeal to us to use the Q&A tab for our questions. 
We'll try as much as possible to take as many questions as time would permit at the end of the presentations. So please use the Q&A tab for the questions. Thank you very much. Edward, Thank you, you have the floor, much. please. Thank you very much, Dr. Dufia, for um, such a, a kind and generous uh, introduction. Um, in terms of what you said about me, um, I would invite the participants to believe none of it, but everything that's said about how fantastic uh, Tom Stuart Coates, my colleague is, um, is absolutely uh, bang on the money. Um, to everybody who's dialed in to join us, thank you very much indeed. We're hoping that over the next um, hour or so, we'll be able to give you um, something of a whistle-stop tour around some of the interesting insights that we've garnered from our experience in asset recovery matters, spanning multiple jurisdictions around the world, and indeed taking place around the world. But before we leap into that, I um, would like to begin this presentation in the way I try to begin all my presentations, which is with a joke, or as Tom pointed out to me a few moments before we came online, um, with an attempt at a joke. I'm hoping it'll be a bit more the former than the latter. Um, today's topic is, however, a rather challenging one to come up with a joke for. Um, although very topical, it is far from uh, ideal joke territory. Um, and that's what led me to Google and Googling asset recovery jokes. Uh, unfortunately, the best I could come up with was a website called Best Jokes to Tell Your Accountant Father, um, which I didn't think was a very fruitful start. And so you'll be pleased to hear I'm not going to inflict any of those on you because I'm, they certainly weren't jokes and I'm not even sure uh, they were attempted jokes. Um, with that aside, we obviously cannot, in the time we have, cover the whole topic of asset recovery strategies or the different strategies that might be pursued uh, in different circumstances and scenarios. What we do hope to do, though, is to draw out key elements of our practical experience from a strategic perspective, and then to try and share with you some hot tips and some points to bear in mind in the event that you should find yourselves in similar situations. So, first of all, what do we see in our practices as the three key steps in asset recovery? Well, the first question is, what assets are where? The second question is, or the second key put step is to secure those assets to ensure that whatever complex structure they've been put in, they're not going to suddenly vanish. In other words, to ensure that they're still there to recover from, to execute against. And the third stage, of course, is to execute against them, that being the last, but certainly the most important. Now, these questions are much more complicated than the 18th century English jurisprudence perhaps ever contemplated they would or could be. Mr. Justice Robert Walker, as he was before he became Lord Walker of the English um, House of Lords, um, coined the term shadowy to describe um, entities that were formed in jurisdictions where secrecy was highly prized and where official regulation was at a low level. Now, everybody has different views about which jurisdictions are more or less shadowy these days, and indeed, a lot of the leading offshore jurisdictions have become substantially more regulated and substantially less secret over the years, and in particular since the global financial crisis. But nonetheless, the very nature of the sorts of claims that give rise to asset recovery requirements, fraud claims, um, and the like, uh, are such that they very often involve lots of jurisdictions, particularly ones that the man in the street may view as shadowy jurisdictions, and also shadowy structures there that are very hard to crack through in order to secure, to secure the real value that may have been taken or that a, a judgment creditor may be entitled to obtain and secure against. So moving on to the first step to focus on that, for the first part of our presentation, what assets are where? Well, in relation to this, the first thing we want to try and get um, participants thinking about today is whether you know all of the weapons, if you're seeking to recover assets, that you have available in your um, putative armory. And as part of that, there's a question about how well you know the weapons that you have in your armory and that you have available to you. And then on the next slide, we pose the question, do you know all the weapons in your neighbor's armory? Because it's all well and good knowing what tools might be available in the jurisdiction in which proceedings are taking place. 
be that Nigeria or be that England and Wales. But are there other tools available to you around the world in other jurisdictions that you could use to get ahead in finding out where assets might be that you could execute against, well, secure, and then execute against, or indeed in um, being able to execute against assets you know about, but you otherwise thought you might not have a shot at obtaining. Well, perhaps unsurprisingly, given that Tom and I have practiced from London, the first stop on our somewhat whistle-stop tour is England and Wales. And the provision that we want to highlight today is a provision of the English Civil Procedure Rules, um, Rule 25.1 sub 1 sub G. Now, Part 25 deals with general um, powers of the English court, one of which is the power to grant a list of particular interim remedies. Interim, obviously, being whilst proceed other proceedings are on foot. And 25.1 sub 1 sub G gives the court the power to make an order directing a party to provide information about the location of relevant property or assets or to provide information about relevant property or assets, which are or may be the subject of an application for a freezing injunction. Now, this is at least in part um, the power that the court is exercising when it makes a freezing injunction, which I know other speakers have talked about earlier in this series of lectures. Um, but they make a free, the courts make a freezing injunction, and at the same time, they require the target to swear an affidavit, perhaps a witness statement, detailing their assets worldwide. And this rule, and this is what we want to home in on, effectively provides a potential freestanding ground to get the information disclosure part of a freezing order injunction without having to obtain the injunction itself, at least at the point where you're seeking to obtain information. So if we break down the provision in a little more detail, you can obtain information about the location of relevant property or assets, and that's location in a general sense, not just jurisdiction, but also um, in a more focused way than that. Or it can be information about relevant property or assets. That's the assets themselves, how they're held, what rights a defendant might have, who else might have rights in respect of the assets. But then crucially, it doesn't need to be assets that are the subject of an application for a freezing injunction or in respect of which a party could obtain freezing relief. It merely may be assets which may be the subject of an application for a freezing injunction. And the existence of this freestand this this right for the to seek and the power for the order to the, the court to grant a freestanding order for disclosure is one, one which um i've long thought somewhat underutilized or certainly underappreciated amongst a lot of english practitioners but also i think potentially international practitioners in different jurisdictions as well if we move on to the next slide we can see there's a there's an interesting line of english cases that focus in on this and the high point of them um in terms of the, the decided and reported cases, the case of called Gerald and Timmis from 2016. Now, this arose from a dispute over um, a very valuable mining um, uh, joint venture in happily not Nigeria, elsewhere in, in the continent of Africa. There was a big fraud claim and a big unlawful means conspiracy claim in England. But um, Mr. Um, Timmis had set up a very complex network of international structures, trusts, companies, and I think there were partnerships as well, that held a lot of the value and the wealth. And the claimants, the victims of the alleged conspiracy and fraud, were desperate, obviously, to find out um, what they were, where they were, and to have a chance of securing uh, assets against them. And But they didn't know who to make as defendants in order to be able to seek proprietary remedies uh, against them. And they also were struggling to obtain all the evidence they might otherwise have wanted uh, to obtain it as part of freezing relief. So an application was made to then Mrs. Justice Rose, now Lady Rose of the English Supreme Court, just to seek disclosure orders or orders that effectively Mr. Timmis disclose um, where all of his assets were. And all that was required to obtain the relief was credible evidence that there was a reasonable possibility that an application might be made for a freezing order in the future. Now, there's obviously a tension there where the information that's being sought may well be used 
to provide the evidence to make the application in due course. But that is, I think, a potential litigation opportunity that's much under underappreciated. Um, you don't need to show to get the order that there's any risk of dissipation, as you would have to show if you were going to successfully obtain a freezing order. And the courts have observed in these cases that the evidential burden on a party seeking a pure disclosure order rather than the freezing order or a freezing order plus disclosure order is lower than the bar when you're seeking your freezing order. And so this is one very useful tool that is worth bearing in mind in order to find out what assets there are, where, how they're held, who the targets might be for further litigation, whether in your main jurisdiction, England or, or elsewhere, um, and to build up the bigger picture that you often need in order to cast your net wide enough to ensure that you've caught all the assets against which you might otherwise execute. So with an eye on the clock, we're gonna take off from Heathrow Airport and we're gonna cross the Atlantic and land in the good old US of A. Who knows what the political situation in the USA is gonna look like at the back end of this year, that you could make exactly that same comment, I'm afraid, about the UK as well. Um, but the provision we want to focus on here is one that people who are participating may already be familiar with, or they may not. That is section 1782 of the US Civil Code. Now, this allows an interested party to foreign proceedings, foreign being outside the USA, whether those proceedings are civil or criminal, and whether those proceedings are already on foot, or it's merely contemplated that they will be initiated in the coming future, it enables them to seek disclosure or witness evidence, a, a deposition, against a target person or entity that's located anywhere in the USA. So long as that evidence, be it documentary or be it witness testimony, is to be used in the foreign proceedings. Now, this is very useful in various respects. Firstly, it may be that you have defendants or you have potential witnesses who are located in the US and it may be you want to get documents from them or you want to depose them. Um, but much more useful than that from a specific asset recovery perspective is that these applications can be made against banking institutions that are based in the US. And if your case has involved dollar money flows, US dollar money flows, then it's almost inevitable that there are going to be trace transactions on the books of banking institutions in the United States, obviously typically in New York, in New York. And you can also seek orders against US clearing agencies and other government bodies as well. Now, this is a very useful tool if you're trying to trace the flow of funds in order to identify ultimate assets against which you can secure. And it can also be very useful um, to obtain substantive evidence in, in proceedings, whether that be to make out a cause of action or whether that be to show that um, account of uh, the defendant has not been straightforward in terms of how many assets they had or what assets they have, whether that goes substantively to the main cause of action, or whether that is useful to show that under a freezing order that you've obtained in Nigeria, in England and Wales, the defendant has not complied with their obligations to give full disclosure of their assets. And that may well be a very useful tool, obviously, in, in all sorts of different respects. Now, neither Tom nor I are obviously US um, attorneys, but this is a provision which we make use of pretty frequently, actually, and indeed increasingly in support of asset recovery and disputes and other disputes, because it is such a useful um, and, and um, fertile tool. Now, there's a word of caution here. And that word of caution is that one has to tread with care in seeking Section 1782 relief when proceedings are already in foot in, the, if I can call it, the main jurisdiction. So to put it another way, if you had a claim in England and Wales against the defendant who you thought was, hi was hiding assets and you wanted to obtain more evidence, you may face difficulties if they were based in the USA and you pursued proceedings under Section 1782 in the USA. Because in that scenario, as we are trying to illustrate, hopefully a little tongue in cheek on the next slide, um, you may be faced with the torpedo of an anti-suit injunction in the main jurisdiction, saying that the pursuit of Section 1782 proceedings is intended to undermine the process of obtaining evidence that the court in the main jurisdiction 
um, pursue, uh, uh, has in place. That said, the potency of this is much reduced if the person you, against whom you're, or from whom you're seeking evidence is not a party, is a third party, is a banking organization. Because in those circumstances, it's not, it can't be said to be trampling on the rights of a party to the English proceedings. The position gets more complicated if, of course, you have someone very closely connected to a party who the defendant in English proceedings was contemplating they might call as a witness. Um, this line of case law in England and Wales originates from a House of Laws decision called the South Carolina Insurance Case, but it's come all the way through to a fairly recent decision in Soriano and Forensic News. The ultimate test that the court applies is whether it's unconscionable conduct, that being conduct which is oppressive or vexatious or which interferes with the due process of the court in seeking relief under Section 1782. Now, if you have a good reason to be seeking that relief from a third party bank, either to seek freezing relief at an early stage of proceedings or because the counterparty is not um, proposing to obtain evidence from that bank, or at least not to obtain evidence from that bank on a on a basis that's transparent and in accordance with the rules. It seems to me you've got a pretty good argument, prima facie at least, that seeking Section 1782 relief in the US wouldn't be oppressive or vexatious or interfering with the due process of the court. But as I say, if what you're seeking to do is get in a free kick early against one of the witnesses um, of a defendant, who the defendant's proposing to call as a witness, that falls in a, in a slightly different camp. Um, so that is some uh, a whistle stop tour of a couple of useful tools that the courts in different jurisdictions around the world can um, give to parties in order to help you find out what assets are where. It may be, however, that the courts can't provide you with the complete answer. And that what you have to do is you have to roll your sleeves up um, uh, as a lawyer, figuratively or literally, and go hunting for raw evidence yourself with your own bare hands. What are the, some of the ways, Tom, that um, we might suggest you could do that in a better or a worse way? Uh, thanks, Edward. Um, yeah, so I, I'll be uh, looking firstly at some out of court steps that can be taken to procure evidence as part of an asset recovery strategy. Um, and in particular, uh, the risks associated with evidence gathering methods that might uh, be regarded as illegal or improper in one or more jurisdictions. Um, it, it is, of course, a, a well-established part of, of many or even uh, most uh, substantial fraud or asset recovery claims to use the services of private investigators or specialist investigation firms to investigate the assets of potential defendants worldwide. Such firms um, sometimes employ specialist forensic accountants or IT specialists and others use former members, perhaps former, perhaps current members of intelligence agencies or security or military forces. Um, these investigators' methods can, can vary widely, but usually include searches through huge databases of information, sometimes available to the public, sometimes only available through proprietary uh, or, or other means. Um, a, a one fruitful source of information, of course, is, is foreign uh, court proceedings, uh, whether civil or criminal in nature, uh, even where uh, you, the applicant or claimant, uh, aren't actually involved in those proceedings. Um, other sources of information include uh, forms of surveillance of targets or, or, or confidential human sources. Um, before I turn uh, to the way uh, in which uh, courts uh, in the common law world treat information that has arguably uh, been obtained uh, through illegal or improper means, um, it's worth noting uh, how difficult it can be uh, in some cases uh, to determine what constitutes illegal uh, or improper means and uh, because what is illegal uh, or improper can vary so much from jurisdiction uh, to uh, jurisdiction uh, 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 and from I uh, to I. Um, in an international recovery exercise, one uh, at least has to keep a, a firm eye 
on the legal and ethical position uh, in the jurisdiction in which the information is obtained, of course, uh, and in the jurisdiction in which it's expected to be deployed. Um, uh, so, so, for example, uh, one might want uh, to obtain the, the information in the US, as, as Ed noted, Edward noted, um, and then to deploy it in support of Nigerian proceedings or English proceedings or what, whatever else. Um, the position uh, can be complicated by the fact that evidence gathering methods uh, will often cross uh, jurisdictional boundaries and one cannot uh, often be sure at the outset uh, where the information might be deployed uh, in due course. Um, for those of us uh, uh, lawyers, um, we must, of course, also uh, have regard at all times uh, to uh, applicable professional ethical obligations uh, binding on us. And, and, and these can, uh, of course, also vary widely from uh, jurisdiction to jurisdiction. And just by way of example of, of, of how much jurisdictions can differ in what they regard as illegal or improper means. Uh, places like Switzerland have uh, famously uh, robust secrecy laws, uh, particularly in relation to banking matters. Uh, uh, and France has a, a, a very expansive notion of privacy. Um, places like England have also legislated more and more uh, in recent years in relation to privacy uh, and, and data protection. I, 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 I suspect that's a trend worldwide. Um, and, and there's also potentially applicable legislation in many jurisdictions covering uh, alleged bribery and corruption, e even bribery and corruption uh, that occurs extraterritorially. Um, I also note, uh, because it's relevant in due course, the often uh, fraught uh, debates about the proper boundary uh, to be drawn between uh, torture and uh, so-called uh, enhanced interrogation techniques. Um, this can be relevant uh, where evidence emerges as a result of criminal investigations uh, and proceedings in jurisdictions uh, which uh, uh, take a uh, more uh, expansive, if I can put it like that, uh, view of permissible uh, interrogation methods. So uh, turning then uh, to the use that can be made of evidence that ha has arguably uh, been obtained uh, via illegal uh, or improper means, um, the basic rule at common law uh, 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 is uh, that in civil proceedings, at least, all relevant evidence will be admissible, even if it's been illegally or improperly obtained. And this remains an extremely important basic principle underpinning the approach to evidence in, in most, if not all, uh, common law jurisdictions. The position in civil law jurisdictions uh, it, it, it is quite different. Um, however, uh, many places, including... Yes, oh, absolutely. Jump, I think we should, just for clarity, make clear that the photograph on screen does not relate to the case involving the Queen from 1955 uh, and instead relates to Cengiz and Immerman. But I suspect you're going to come on to that, Tom. Uh, I, I, I am grateful for the clarification. Um, that, that is indeed correct. Um, uh, so uh, many, many jurisdictions, including uh, common law jurisdictions, uh, now expressly recognise uh, notwithstanding the basic principle that all relevant evidence is admissible, uh, that uh, the court has a discretion to refuse to admit uh, relevant evidence where it has been improperly or illegally uh, procured. Uh, in England, there's an express uh, rule in the Civil Procedure Rules 32.1, uh, broadly uh, affording the court a discretion. Uh, in Australia, just by way of example, uh, it, it, it's fine statutory footing. Uh, there are, as I understand it, equivalent provisions in, in, in many common law jurisdictions. As Edward noted, uh, the picture up on the slide uh, does not uh, relate in any way uh, to uh, Her Majesty. Um, it, it is uh, instead a picture of the uh, uh, of Robert Chengi's um, uh, very well known entrepreneur based in the UK and his former wife. Uh, in widely reported uh, divorce proceedings involving uh, uh, Mr. Chengiz, uh, the court considered these sorts of issues and expressly disapproved of a, 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 a quite remarkable previous uh, practice uh, endorsed apparently by uh, the family division of the English High Court, uh, whereby spouses were permitted uh, or even encouraged to access documents belonging to the other spouse, uh, whether confidential or not, 
so long as no force was used to obtain those documents. Um, I'll I turn on in a moment to the way in which the courts have in practice uh, exercised their discretion to refuse to admit illegally or improperly obtained evidence. But it's worth looking first at some uh, examples, sometimes colourful examples, of evidence uh, gathering methods that have uh, allegedly been employed um, and have been uh, uh, the propriety of which has been contested uh, in uh, various uh, cases. So going through these uh, methods in uh, very rough and ready uh, and inherently uh, quite uh, subjective order uh, of perceived, uh, at least in my view, inappropriateness uh, from most marginal uh, to most egregious, uh, the courts have uh, firstly uh, considered uh, uh, in um, the first case up there, Property Alliance Group and uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, um, uh, circumstances where the claimant's managing director had secretly recorded uh, meetings he'd had uh, with the defendant bank's former employees. Uh, not only uh, had uh, these recordings uh, been done secretly, uh, but they were also done on false pretenses uh, because he told them that he was interested in setting up some sort of business relations with them or, or their companies. Um, it, it's worth noting uh, that the actual issue on this particular application, as is not uncommon in these sorts of cases where dubious evidence gathering methods have been used, was whether the claimant had lost privilege in the recordings as against the bank defendant, because the dominant purpose was, at least from the employee's perspective, uh, to establish business relations and not to procure evidence for litigation. Um, accordingly, the claimant's deception uh, ultimately uh, uh, worked against it in that case. Um, in another uh, interesting and, and colourful case, uh, Dubai Aluminium and Al Hawaii, uh, it was alleged that private investigators had used uh, various uh, uh, illegal or improper methods to obtain evidence, uh, including uh, uh, searching the defendant's dustbins uh, for information uh, and making uh, deceptive calls uh, to the defendant's banks. Um, again, interestingly, the key issue on the actual application was whether privilege in investigations, in the investigations, had been lost as a result of the alleged criminality of the investi investigatory methods. Um, so it's worth bearing in mind that in addition to the risk uh, that uh, your evidence may be found uh, not to be admissible in due course and some other risks which I'll come on to. Uh, there is also a risk that even if you find evidence uh, and you ultimately decide not to make use of it, um, if it transpires, if, 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 if the other side uh, get wind of it and uh, want to go on a, a, a hunt through your investigatory methods, you may, may well find out that you've lost a privilege that would otherwise have attached uh, to uh, those methods. Um, so uh, whistling through a few more examples, um, various cases have considered the position in respect of uh, illicitly uh, made recordings, i.e. Uh, recordings made uh, without uh, the other person's consent. Uh, in uh, the first case up on this slide, the court refused to admit uh, tape recordings of the private deliberations of an employer's uh, disciplinary panel uh, made without knowledge of the panel members in a claim for unfair dismissal. Um, this is an interesting uh, and, and somewhat rare example, actually, of the English courts refusing to admit otherwise relevant evidence. Uh, and, and one reason for this may well be that the uh, disciplinary uh, panel uh, uh, was something akin to a, a, a judicial tribunal, albeit in a private setting. Uh, which, which may well have influenced uh, the court's uh, view of the propriety of, of, of what allegedly went on or what actually went on. Um, in, in, in the second example up on the slide, uh, the court refused to strike out a claim, interestingly, relying on evidence obtained by unlawful hacking of the defendant's emails. So there was, there was undoubtedly unlawful uh, hacking of the defendant's emails, or at least it was assumed so for the purposes of the application. Um, uh, but uh, the court, uh, nonetheless, uh, uh, allowed the claims to proceed and allowed uh, 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 in due course uh, the uh, uh, claimant to rely on uh, that uh, uh, evidence and because otherwise that would have left the defendant with the benefit of uh, the seriously fraudulent conduct uh, which had been uncovered 
uh, by the otherwise uh, dubious means. Uh, finally, uh, final examples on the uh, most serious end of the spectrum. Another possibility is evidence procured uh, by bribery or the corruption of government uh, officials. Um, I've not actually found, managed to find a, a case specifically dealing with this question in the context of uh, admissibility of evidence, uh, but one suspects uh, that the court uh, will take a, a rather more robust uh, uh, approach to it um, than uh, some of the other examples we've looked at. And finally, uh, the UK Supreme Court has recently considered uh, the admissibility of evidence allegedly procured by torture in the Shah Gang shipping and HNA uh, group case, holding that if it is proved on the balance of probabilities that a confession or rather statement was made as a result of torture, evidence of the statement is not admissible uh, and must be excluded from discretion, uh, from consideration altogether when deciding uh, the facts in issue. So it's, it's not even a matter of discretion there. The evidence must be excluded uh, if it's proven on the balance of probabilities uh, that it was procured uh, by torture. So turning then briefly uh, to the exercise of the court's discretion in practice, uh, whether to admit or to refuse to admit uh, evidence procured by unlawful or improper means, uh, with the exception of cases uh, where evidence has pro been procured by torture, this is generally an extremely fact-sensitive exercise which involves the court balancing a series of uh, competing important policy considerations, uh, including uh, confidentiality, potentially of third parties, privacy rights, again, potentially of third parties, uh, uh, as against uh, rights to rely on, on otherwise relevant evidence, uh, the need to avoid incentivizing unlawful or improper conduct, uh, and perhaps most fundamentally from the court's perspective, the need to ensure a, a fair trial on the basis of all relevant evidence. So, uh, leaving aside the question of... Sorry, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt, ju jump. just on the Raz al Kama case, um, it, it might be interesting to observe, and I have to be careful what I say because I'm acting for one of the um, defendants to one of these actions, but there are a series of claims working their way through the commercial court here in London now against um, the US law firm Deckard that was involved in relation to certain aspects of um, RAK's um, defence and prosecution of proceedings and against individual solicitors um, who are partners at the firm and involved in it relating specifically to um the way in which evidence was obtained and then and then subsequently prevented so i mentioned that um not in any way suggesting there's any substance to the claims that are being pursued um but just to say that, that there are litigators out there around the world who are thinking about ways in which to effectively weaponize um the approach that lawyers take to litigation sorry tom no, I, I, absolutely, um, and and it 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 relied reminded me of a, a, another potential issue uh, with um, that we, we we discussed the other day uh, in relation to um, evidence that has been procured uh, by the sorts of private investigation firms that are so often uh, employed in these cases, uh, which is that um, it, 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 in one case that's that's again been rumbling through uh, the English courts. Um, the allegation was not uh, necessarily or was not limited to the suggestion that evidence was procured by illegal means, um, but the, the evidence itself uh, was a, a forgery uh, or, or, or was forged. So that's that's obviously something else that one needs to keep a firm eye on uh, when considering uh, uh, the products of these sorts of investigations, the possibility that uh, perhaps even through no fault whatsoever of the investigators, um, what turns up may well end up being um, uh, unreliable evidence. Um, so then, so, so, so as I said, leaving aside the question of whether the illegally obtained uh, evidence is admissible in court, uh, in the court in which it's sought to be deployed, uh, there are various ways in which the use of that evidence or the way in which it was procured uh, can be attacked uh, by the defendant or some affected uh, third party. And um, by way of example, an injunction can be sought, uh, perhaps from a, an entirely different court in a different jurisdiction, uh, restraining the use of the illegally or improperly obtained evidence. So you might be in the position where 
uh, you have this useful evidence um, and the English courts or the Nigerian courts or wherever uh, are, are happy or, or at least um, prepared uh, to admit it into evidence. Um, but uh, the other side managed to get a, an injunction from some foreign court preventing you from making use of it. Um, obviously, uh, in those circumstances, uh, it, 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 it's um, uh, one is left in a very difficult position, particularly if, um, uh, if if the relevant party is is otherwise subject to the jurisdiction of that foreign court. Um, the party uh, procuring or deploying uh, evidence could also face a damages claim uh, by the affected party in breach of confidence, breach of privacy, or some other uh, statutory cause of action that one finds in in many jurisdictions. And finally, um, but importantly, the party procuring or deploying um, illegally or improperly procured evidence uh, could face uh, criminal proceedings in relation to the methods used uh, to procure that evidence. Again, not necessarily in the forum court in which they want to use the evidence, uh, but potentially in some other foreign court where the evidence was uh, allegedly procured. Um, dealing then uh, briefly with practical steps that can be taken to maximize the chances that evidence can successfully be deployed and to minimize the risk of the sorts of collateral attacks we just looked at. Um, first, uh, 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 and perhaps obviously one should assess at all times uh, what the applicable legal regimes are uh, in all potentially relevant jurisdictions. As I noted before, um, that can uh, cross a variety of jurisdictions. Second, one should uh, take care in any instructions to investigators to expressly state, uh, obviously, that no unlawful methods can be used, and perhaps even to spell out those methods that can and cannot be used. Uh, and finally, after the investigations have been done and any report has been received, uh, one should confirm that no impermissible methods have been used. Thanks very much, Tom. So those are ways in which you can find out what assets there may be and where they may be around the world. What, though, if those assets have been buried in some of the shadowy structures that I alluded to at the outset? What tools may be available um, around the world in order to try to allow the excavation of those assets? Um, whether those are tools that are available if you're pursuing um, a freestanding claim in a major jurisdiction like England or the US, or potentially um, tools that might be available if you can somehow get ancillary proceedings on foot in, um, say, England or some of the offshore jurisdictions that could allow you to dig up those treasures uh, in order to return them to the people for whom you are acting, to whom to who may have a, a much more legitimate claim in respect to them. So uh, uh, one uh, extremely uh, powerful tool uh, in the armory of asset recovery uh, litigators, uh, which will uh, uh, almost certainly be uh, uh, familiar to um, most, if not all, in the audience, uh, is the ability in many uh, jurisdictions to uh, unwind uh, transactions at an undervalue uh, that have been done uh, to uh, uh, prejudice uh, potential creditors. Um, actions of this sort have um, an ancient pedigree uh, deriving ultimately, uh, it is thought, uh, from the Roman Actio Pauliana um, and slightly more recently, slightly more recently, uh, from the uh, Fraudulent Conveyances Act 1571, uh, an English statute passed under Queen Elizabeth I. Um, Many common law ju jurisdictions have uh, statutory causes of action along these lines, um, which can but need not arise in an insolvency context, although uh, by way of example, uh, the most relevant English provision uh, it can be found in our main insolvency legislation. It's not at all restricted to an insolvency context. I've set up a few examples, uh, just illustrative examples on the slide uh, of le legislation along these lines. Um, I'll be focusing on uh, uh, the English statutory provision, section 423 of the Insolvency Act 1986, because both because it's, it's, it's the provision I'm most familiar with, but also because it's proving such a fertile uh, terrain for international asset recovery litigators uh, and has proven to be such a powerful tool 
uh, for creditors to seek to unwind transactions uh, even after the horse has apparently bolted. Um, another interesting uh, provision that uh, Edward and I were uh, discussing uh, earlier, which is available in England, uh, which is not up on the slide, uh, is Section 37 of the Matrimonial Causes Act. Um, which... Oh, yes, it is. Bullet point three, Tom. It is. <laughs> oh, I apologise. <laughs> Fans of Star uh, uh, Wars will approve of the Jedi mind tricks. Extraordinary. Um, which uh, I'm, I'm grateful then, uh, which performs a similar function in respect of matrimonial uh, disputes uh, as Section 423 does in relation to general disputes, um, but which has a wider, potentially wider scope in some, uh, some respects and has been the subject of, of some interesting recent case law, uh, some of which I understand has involved um, uh, Edward and other members of this chambers. Um, in the time available, uh, we can do no more than scratch the surface of the fascinating and continuously developing uh, jurisdiction that is Section 423 of the 1986 Act. Um, however, it, it, I think it's worth noting a few important issues of principle and areas of recent judicial development. In very broad terms, uh, Section 423 allows a party to ask the court to unwind a transaction entered into at an undervalue where the person entering into the transaction has done so for the purpose of putting assets beyond the reach of a person who is making or may at some time make a claim against him or otherwise prejudicing the interests of that person. Um, the claim uh, uh, can be brought by uh, what's described in the legislation as a victim of the transaction, which is defined as a person who is very broadly as a person who's who is or is capable of being uh, prejudiced by the transaction. Um, as to the points of principle, first, the English courts have recognised uh, the extraterritorial reach of this section. Uh, it can extend to foreign defendants, foreign assets, foreign transactions, so long as there is in the English courts view a sufficient connection uh, with England and Wales, which is a, a fact specific question and English uh, judges seem uh, very willing uh, to assume uh, jurisdiction in all sorts of uh, interesting uh, uh, disputes uh, which might otherwise be thought to have a, a more substantial connection with other jurisdictions. Um, secondly, uh, the courts have recognised uh, that a transaction for the purposes of this section is drawn very widely. There's an extremely interesting recent Court of Appeal case up on the slide. Uh, I, I, I don't have the time now to go into the details of that, but it's, it's, it's also on appeal to the Supreme Court. Um, so watch that space. Uh, thirdly, and importantly, uh, the victim of a, of a transaction being the person seeking the unwinding of the relevant transaction need not be the same person uh, as the uh, creditor uh, which the respondent intended to defraud by affecting the relevant transaction. Uh, and, and in many cases, it won't be the same person. Um, and fourth, uh, on the next slide, in a development that uh, has uh, so far gone under the radar among commentators, and I, I only happen to be aware of it having been involved uh, in the case, uh, the English court has recently confirmed that the claim which the relevant debtor intended to avoid can include a claim by a government asserting a sovereign claim. So that could include uh, claims that only the government can make, for example, claims by tax authorities or, or claims pursuant to criminal enforcement powers. And if this decision stands, it potentially has far reaching consequences uh, 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 since the purpose of, of much aggressive international tax planning uh, could arguably be said to amount to a relevant purpose uh, uh, for the purposes of Section 423. Um, finally, I, I note that the range of remedies available to the court to reverse the effects uh, of a, uh, a transaction pursuant to Section 423 is extremely broad uh, and very flexible indeed. So, coming into the home stretch of our um, hour of presentation, the last topic that we wanted to touch on concerns whether one should view the so-called shadowy offshore jurisdictions as friend or foe. Well, there's undoubtedly some very extreme ones out there where the development of the court system and procedure is so um, embryonic, at least to an international community, 
that one should be very cautious. But in terms of the major offshore jurisdictions that now to a very large degree um, should not be seen as shadowy at all, um, although there's a concern often amongst onshore litigators that foreign juris that, that offshore jurisdictions courts are going to be very defensive of sharing information or allowing people trying to attack asset structures to attack them. There's very often a good case for investigating whether there are useful tools available to you if you go to begin proceedings or ancillary proceedings in these jurisdictions. Um, to give you an example from recent experience, I've been involved in a matter that's a large fraud claim um, involving a fraud taking place in um, continental Europe. There are proceedings on foot in the UK and and one of the parties that is seeking to claim assets in the UK, making a proprietary claim to assets in the UK, has in fact begun proceedings in the offshore jurisdiction for appropriate declaratory relief as to what the, the, um, the person who's holding assets, nominally at least as trustee, because um, the alleged fraudster took assets, settled them into an offshore trust, um, and for the benefit of, of at least on, on its face, not him, uh, and thought that would put them out of the reach of creditors. But what's being said is that the trustees in fact hold those assets as constructive trustee for the defrauded parties and not for the named beneficiaries on the trust instrument itself. And so what's happened is proceedings have been begun offshore um, in order to manage the, the administration of those assets pending determination of what you might call the main claim onshore. And indeed, it may be the case, depending on what the assets are and where they are, go back to our first, um, the first key step of the asset recovery process, that there can be a case for pursuing substantive proceedings in the offshore jurisdictions. I know there's a lot more we could say about that and the tactics around it, but we're close up towards the end of our hour. And I know there are some questions that have already come through on the Q&A session, um, the Q&A system. So perhaps we could pivot onto um, some of those and just pick those up and any other questions that come hot on the heels of the answers that we give. Um, the first very helpful question from Mark Lekongbe concerns, I think, the applications for disclosure orders that you can make in England under the English Civil Procedure Rules, um, Rule 25.11G. And he asks, are freestanding discovery orders made ex parte? If not, won't the application on notice tip off the debtor to begin to conceal assets? Or would the order also prevent them from disposing or dealing otherwise with those assets? Well, that's a very good question and touches on one of the, the key tactical issues, which we didn't have time um, in our hour to delve into greater detail around. You're absolutely right that tipping off is a risk if you're just seeking disclosure, a disclosure order, and you aren't immediately seeking to restrain the assets as well. But one can well imagine there's lots of other instances where just knowing about the assets is useful. It may be because you are going to make uh, a particular application in very short order, not necessarily in England and Wales, because it might not bite on the asset in another jurisdiction, but in that other jurisdiction. And you need clear evidence in order to form the basis of the application. But also to go back to the example I was giving of when it can be useful to go to offshore jurisdictions to seek relief, it's not always the case, particularly if the assets at least nominally been taken out of the hands of an alleged fraudster. It's not always the case that um, if the fraudster is tipped off that you know about the assets, the assets are going to vanish. And in those instances, it remains a, a, a very useful tool indeed. Um, the, the second question we've got is from Usamatu Abubakar. Thanks for the insightful presentation. Well, that's very kind. Um, my question is, to what extent, if any, does this case law apply in Nigeria? Um, well, I'm not going to seek to stick my neck out uh, in a virtual room full of nearly 500 um, expert Nigerian lawyers um, to give a, 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 a decisive answer on that. Um, all I will and can say is I know from my experience of Niger Nigerian disputes before the Nigerian courts where I've been assisting in the background or on international aspects, and also from the work I've done applying Nigerian law in, in the English and other courts, um, English law, English law and English authorities are persuasive um, when the Nigerian courts have to interpret the common law um, to the extent that still um, applies um, as a matter of, of Nigerian procedural and substantive law. So it's likely that save where they turn on specific British statutes or British rules of court that have no equivalent in Nigeria, it's likely that they can still be of useful 
um, persuasive effect, even if you're seeking to use them uh, in Nigeria or to seek this particular relief from the Nigerian courts. Tom, shall I bat the last one to you? Uh, yes. So uh, we have a, a question, which is, uh, what are the options available uh, to a judgment creditor uh, where the only asset of a judgment debtor capable of satisfying the judgment debt is located in a foreign uh, jurisdiction? Um, the question of um, the use of, so, so for example, I assume this is a case where one has a, a Nigerian judgment debt and one may, wants to make use of that uh, somewhere else in the world. And that's something that um, both Edward and I uh, have done a lot of. Um, and it, basically, you want to find a method to firstly turn uh, that uh, judgment into uh, a judgment of uh, that jurisdiction, other jurisdiction where there are, in fact, assets, or you expect there may be assets. Um, across the common law world, um, there are various methods to do that. One can do a claim at common law, but often there are uh, more efficient and streamlined uh, statutory measures to turn it into a, for example, a BVI judgment or an English judgment or, 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 or whatever else. Um, and then uh, once you have that, you have your uh, full range of execution measures available in most uh, common law jurisdictions. And obviously, as part of the piece, uh, to the extent you want to make sure that assets don't disappear, you've got all the usual interim measures that, that Edwards looked at. We've got two more questions that have cropped up right on the final whistle. Um, taking them in, re in reverse order, Benson Tegu's asked, can a Nigerian creditor recover debts from a UK company who's moved out of Nigeria but is still a going concern in the UK? If yes, what's the process? Well, there may be routes available to you in Nigeria, but you're likely to have, I suspect, enforcement issues. You can enforce debts incurred anywhere around the world in England. Um, if there's a dispute over them, you have to pursue um, civil proceedings, um, effectively a high court claim. But if the debt's not disputed or there's been admissions about it, then it may be you can present a winding up petition on a relatively cost effective and quick and easy basis in the English High Court. And that could be a useful um, route for you. Um, then finally, Deborah Adumas asked uh, for more clarity on evidence uh, obtained illegally. Um, I hope the slides we've produced are going to be circulated. You'll see our email addresses on those slides. Um, I'm putting words into Tom's mouth. Uh, but I'm sure if you want to drop us a quick line for, for more particular detail, we'd be really happy to do anything we can to help. Um, and the same goes for all the other participants. Thank you very much for listening and, and for joining us. Thank you very much, Edward and Tom, for the very brilliant presentation. Unfortunately, we can't take more questions, though they are coming in. But I want to profoundly thank you for the very brilliant, insightful presentation. Um, we learned a lot from it. Um, I can see about 470-something people are still online. Yeah. And um, there are so many um, feedback and very positive reviews coming in in the chat room. So we're grateful. Thank you. On behalf of Tobena Erojikwe, the chairman of MBA, -E, we want to thank you. Thank you for finding time out of your busy schedule and for the industry. I don't know if you have any final words before we draw the curtains. It's been a great pleasure to be presenting. Thank you very much for inviting us. Um, thank you everyone to, for, for tuning in. And as I say, anything we can do to help, uh, we're very happy to. Thank you very much indeed. It's been an honor. Thank you very much. Thank you thank very you. much. Um, the slides will be made available. And of course, um, if you're looking for Edward and Tom, you know their names and you know where to find them. You can easily search and you find them or you get in touch and we'll link you up because I can see people sending private messages on how they can get to Edward and Tom. Um, so you can do that and we'll link you up with Edward and Tom. So thank you very much to the participants too for finding time out of your busy schedule and staying active and um, participating actively in the session. We look forward to having you tomorrow. We'll be having Chidi Ekezie and Temitayo Adegoke, they are head of legal of two of leading banks in Nigeria. And they will be speaking from the perspective of clients on their expectations from lawyers in Nigeria when it comes to debt recovery and asset tracing. So we look forward to having you again tomorrow, two o'clock West African time. So I think it's a convenient time to draw the curtains. Have a brilliant day ahead. Thank you. Cheers.
Bye-bye. Good day.